Welcome back to another 90 Day Fiance recap. I already posted a video on Amanda, so go watch it if you haven't. I wanted to mention that Amanda did leave a comment on that video, so I pinned it. Just remember, she's a real person, and we don't know her entire story. We only know what TLC decides to air and show us, so just keep that in mind when you respond to her. All right, let's talk about the remaining couples from Season 6, Episode 1 of Before the 90 Days. We're obsessed with TLC and all the trashy reality TV. It's, it's a, a recap. It's a recap. It's a recap. This is Riley. He's 48 years old from Pennsylvania. He loves music, especially jazz. Oh my god, so do I, Riley. L is for the way you look at me. And he has a dog. <laughs> Me too. Oh my god, Riley, maybe we're a match. Uh, I'm fucking unhinged today. Sorry. He works in public safety for the US government, and before that, he was in the military for eight years. For his current job, he's been trained to think of the most insane situations and know how to deal with it. And because he's been so heavily trained to never let his guard down, it's unfortunately bled into his personal and his romantic life. One of his relationships, he caught his ex cheating on him. Like, he actually caught her in person. He went to her house and then caught her with another dude. And that dude was his friend. Yeah, that that's like a double whammy. A few years later, he was like, all right, I'm ready to date again. And he started dating this woman. Things were going amazing. He knew she was the one, so he put a ring on layaway to propose. And one day, she just left. And he never heard from her again. That put him in a super dark place, and he was really lonely. Some time passes, and one day he decides to download a Vietnamese dating app. And it's so funny to me that there are these very niche, very specific dating apps. Like, you could find a dating app for pretty much any category these days. Through that app, he met 43-year-old Violet, and he describes her as the sweetest jerk he's ever met in his life. I thought that was kind of cute. Are you excited for me to come and visit? A, a little, a, just a little bit, yeah. They seem to joke a lot with each other and they kind of roast each other. That was the vibe I got, which I find is always fun. But not everybody can handle roasts. Most people are very sensitive. And when you have like a roasting relationship, you have to know your limits, what you can roast about and what you can't roast about. And you also know when you can roast and when you shouldn't roast. Like you can't just roast your person all day. There's a time where you have to be serious. So I feel like if someone gets your humor and you guys can roast each other within your boundaries, that's special. I think it's cute they have this super playful, sarcastic banter without being all mushy-gushy, you know? The thing I am concerned about is he made it clear that he doesn't say I love you to anyone anymore, like period, because every time he says I love you out loud, that person leaves. You love me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that word. I don't say I love you. I don't ever say I love you. And that's super sad to hear. He definitely has a huge wall up, and I think that's why he uses his middle finger as a way of protecting himself. He's afraid to be that vulnerable again. And jokes are fun and all, but like I said before, you can't joke 24-7. You have to know when to be serious. And I'm sure she's gonna want to hear that he loves her someday. You know, it's not always gonna be, here, I give you my finger, fuck you, I I fucking hate you, but that really means I fucking love you, but I'm not gonna say I love you, but I fucking hate you, which means I love you, so just take it that way. Like, oh, you know, like someday you're gonna wanna stop that. I'm worried he's so jaded that Violet's gonna be the one to suffer and have to deal with all his baggage, for lack of a better word. I'm gonna assume he hasn't worked through all his feelings and his past and all the hurt that he's experienced. I feel like he bottled it all up and just threw the bottle away to never have to deal with it. And that's not healthy. I know it's scary to face our feelings. That's the number one reason people don't wanna go to therapy, but it's something we have to do in order to process it and then move on from it. All right, so he goes out to meet some of his friends to celebrate Juneteenth. His friends are shocked he's actually going to Vietnam to meet his girlfriend and they start grilling him, asking him questions. They're like, did you send her money? And he's like, no. And you know what? I actually believe him. <laughs> 
In a lot of cases, people say no because they're embarrassed, but I actually believe he didn't send money because he's so guarded. And I feel like if he sends money, that's like him breaking down his walls again. And he doesn't want to look dumb. He doesn't want to feel stupid again. He doesn't want to feel used. And so I feel like not sending her money is another way to protect himself. He did say he sent her daughter $100 for her 16th birthday, which I thought was very sweet. Violet has two daughters, 16 and 20 years old. I actually have a great relationship with them, and I would love the opportunity to spoil them rotten. With their means. <laughs> now, he talks about some of her red flags, and I feel like this first one isn't even a red flag. It's like barely a yellow flag. So the semi-yellow flag is, according to Riley, she lied about being divorced during the first three months of their relationship. Apparently, he asked her very directly, are you divorced? And she said she was. And he would ask her periodically, are you sure you're divorced? And she was like, yes, I am. But then three months after, she told him that her divorce was finalized. So to him, he's like, oh my God, so you lied to me every single time I asked you, are you divorced? But how I took it was she probably filed for divorce, but it was three months later where it was finalized. Like because she filed for the divorce in her head, yeah, she was divorced. Does that make sense? Especially when you have a communication barrier or a language barrier. I can see how she couldn't really explain all of that, but I don't know. I'm just making assumptions over here. Now, the other red flag, which I do think is a red flag, he found her still active on the dating app where they met. Now, apparently he got back on the dating app to see if she was on it. And then he found her and then he confronted her. And then she said, well, then why are you still on the dating app? And that caused a big fight. But they've worked through all of that. And I guess things are better. And now he's going to go to Vietnam to meet her in person and see how things go. So that's exciting. But I, I am scared. I'm scared. And even though we did resolve these things, there's still that little bit in me that I'm just not sure I believe her. I like Riley. He actually looks like a guy I used to date, um, like an older version. It's so bizarre because every time I see Riley, I'm like, oh, my God, he looks like an older version of my ex. Um, yeah, I want to like Riley. I want to like Violet. I'm rooting for them, but I'm scared, you know? All right, let's move on to Tyrae and Carmella. This is Tyrae. He's 33 and lives in California. And he's a freaking gem. I love him. I have a crush on him. I will date you, Tyra, if you're still single and into potatoes. <laughs> the opening scene is of him with a ukulele. And I can't really say he's playing it, although he looks like he's playing it. But then when the sound comes on, he's not playing it. He's really, really bad. <laughs> But you know what he said? He said that he picked up the ukulele because everyone who plays it looks happy. <laughs> Why is that so sad? He shares about his struggles with his weight and it's always been an insecurity of his. And oh my God, I think I'm getting emotional and I don't know why. He grew up without a lot of friends and so chocolate became his best friend. Oh my God, I'm getting emotional and I have no idea why. I can relate to him, which is like the sad thing. Like when I hear his story, I get sad. I'm sorry, I am PMSing. I'm so sorry about that. Let's try this again. He grew up without a lot of friends. Oh my God. I feel insecure sometimes, too, because of my weight. It's always been a struggle. I've always been a big guy. Food became a real comfort for me, especially like chocolate. I love chocolate, so <laughs> that's like my best friend. And his insecurities with his weight has prevented him from dating, and he admits he's a 33-year-old virgin. It's really embarrassing to admit I'm like 33 years old and still a virgin. As soon as he said that, I was like, oh, Tyree. Honestly, he shouldn't be ashamed of that. And I think he's cute and he seems to have such a great personality and we learn later that he's so, so sweet and caring. His mom moved in with him a year ago, so they live in his one bedroom apartment together. Oh my God. And he's actually her full-time caretaker. 
Last year, his mom found out she had a brain tumor and then a stroke, and I don't think she's able to walk anymore because he said something like, we're going to get you back into those heels. He was a claims representative for an insurance company, but he had to quit his job to help his mom full time. His father is not in the picture because he passed away when Ty Ray was only four years old. And then we find out his father was murdered. He got into an argument with a friend at a park and um, he was murdered. Oh my God, this is so sad. So his mom was a single mom of four kids, including him, and she struggled a lot and they were homeless a couple times. And he recognizes how much she sacrificed for him and his uh, siblings. And he feels like the least he can do to, you know, repay her is to take care of her. My mom, she raised us all by herself. Money was very hard. We were homeless a few times. My mom had to make a lot of sacrifices for us. So I felt like I owed her to actually say, hey, you know, this is more important right now to put what, what I want on the back burner for her. And that's so sweet. Oh, my God. I felt like, wow, he's really an angel. And he can cook, too. Look how good that looks. Dinner's ready. Dinner's ready? Yeah. I'll make you some salmon and some oh, wow. vegetables. Because he's a full-time caretaker, he doesn't have much of a social life, so he started going online to meet people, and that's where he met Carmela. He's been talking to her for four years, and not only is she super hot, but she's super sweet too. She's been so supportive of him through everything, and he really loves her and wants to marry her. The only red flag is he's never video chatted with her in four years. Never, not one video chat. Have you ever asked her to video chat you? I did once, but she didn't say anything, so I didn't really, uh, you know, I took it as a no. Maybe she's not comfortable, or maybe she doesn't like video chatting. I know a lot of people don't. Oh my God, we know where this is going, and it breaks my heart because I freaking love him, and he deserves the best. So in the next scene, the producers pull Tyre aside, and they break the fourth wall in episode one. Has that ever happened? I don't think so. I'm like, what the fork is going on? The producer says, we just found out Carmela's a catfish. The woman in the photos that you've been talking to for four years is not real. It's a different person. And they're all like, you know what? We're going to respect your wishes. What do you want to do? If you don't want to film anymore, if you want us to get rid of the footage, we will. And I'm like, what? TLC actually looking out for a castmate? Never. I don't believe you for a second. Like, what is the real deal? I don't know, but they actually said that. So I'm like, okay, this is weird. He's so shocked. And the producer tells him this person is not a woman. He's a man. person you've been messaging with is a man. Wow. Now, in the preview for the next episode, it looks like he still wants to meet him. And I don't know if it's for the free vacation or, and this is my guess, he might be bisexual. And so the idea that it could be a man, he's, he still wants to meet him to see if there's a possible love connection. I mean, four years of talking, I feel like they've shared a lot of information and have created a very strong bond. So I feel like he could want to go and meet him. What do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments. Let's move on to David and Sheila. Oh my God. It's just like sad story after sad story after sad story. So this is David, 42, from Nebraska, and he was born deaf. His opening scene, actually not just his opening scene, it was all throughout his segments. They would edit it with minimal sound. And I personally appreciated that. I don't know if anyone else enjoyed that or didn't like it, but I did only because it constantly, when they edited it, they edited it, it they edited it. Oh my God, that's weird. They edited it. So every time they edited it, it, it that way, <laughs> it put me in his shoes and reminded me, oh, this is how he like experiences the world. He doesn't hear anything. He was the only deaf person in his family. He was born in an all hearing family. And I thought that was really sad because I can't imagine how lonely it must have been for him and isolating when he sees his entire family talking to each other. Actually, there's a show, Ginny and Georgia. I don't know if you guys have watched it, but um, one of the family, Maxine, I think that's her name. Maxine's family, she has a brother, a mom, and a dad. And her dad 
is deaf. And they all sign as they're speaking. And I thought that was amazing because the dad is always constantly in the know and in the conversation because even though you're speaking, they're also signing. So he's always knowing what's going on. And I really, really enjoyed that. And I don't know if that was a case for him because he mentions how lonely it was to grow up into an all hearing family. And also he mentions it was really hard for him to communicate with his parents. So that made me wonder if any of them learned sign language for him. And I feel like they didn't only because he says they eventually sent him to a boarding school for deaf students and that's where he learned ASL. So I, I, that leads me to believe he didn't know sign language before. Therefore, his parents and family members didn't learn sign language. I don't know if that's true. That's just an assumption. Um, so when he went to the boarding school, he was able to make friends with people just like him. He finally felt at home. And he stayed there until he was 20 years old and he graduated, then was thrown back into the real world with full of hearing people and he felt lonely again. Okay, so David came to a point in his life where he really wanted to settle down, get married and have a family of his own. He put himself out there and so many women rejected him. But then he met another deaf woman and fell in love with her. It was amazing until they broke up because she cheated on him. Oh my god, it's so sad. But it's okay. He has a new girlfriend. Her name is Sheila. She's 31 from the Philippines. She was born hearing, but started having issues with it at six years old. She wears hearing aids, but is also learning ASL. She has a 12-year-old son, and David's really excited to build a family with her and her son. And it's so cute because he's like, every time I think about her or talk to her, my heart beats fast. And I'm just like, oh my god so sweet these people oh my god I just realized I've never rooted for this many American people on the show like you know how we usually mostly hate the Americans because they're so obnoxious and so entitled but what the fork is up with the season we're just like <gasps> please find love these people better have happy endings or I am going to the TLC producers or specifically the 90 day fiance producers and I'm gonna give them all spoons and tell them to eat my ass Okay, just scoop it up and eat it. Okay, so David tells us Sheila has never asked him for money for the entire first year of their relationship. However, the second year, she started asking him for money, but it was because of COVID and she lost her job, so she needed help, which is totally understandable. And then her house caught on fire and then it got hit by a typhoon. What the fork? Can these people catch a break? Like, I'm just heartbroken and heartbroken, and I don't know if my heart can take this anymore. What the fork? And last but not least, we have Gino and Jasmine. Thank God for them because they allowed me to laugh. I was like, whew, finally a couple I can make fun of. Gino and his 53 hats are back. He's at the hair salon looking at some hair. At first I thought he was looking for himself because I've seen those videos on TikTok where guys and men are losing hair and so they get temporary like glued in hair extensions. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? And it's insane what a huge difference it makes on a guy when they have hair and when they don't have hair. My favorite thing about these transformation videos is how happy the men look after they get their hair done. And I swear men deserve to feel confident too. I think hair extensions should be normalized. And I also think makeup for straight men should be normalized. Men who deal with acne or texture skin if they want to cover up a little bit why not they should have tinted moisturizer a bb cream a cc cream like and if they want to go full-fledged foundation so be it i don't know men are getting their nails done like who cares let them let them have makeup so that's what i thought gino was doing but no he's actually there for jasmine the hairstylists say a box of hair extensions is 320 20 dollars are you freaking kidding me and then they say she needs five boxes <laughs> that's uh i can't do math let's pull up a calculator that's 1600 dollars worth of hair extensions and jasmine says she needs it all that's insane hair extensions is actually something i never really got into because my head is super sensitive but it also could have to do with the fact that i used to sell hair extensions and i was forced to wear them at work for obvious reasons and i'm telling you i still have a permanent spot on the back of my head 
where it still hurts when I put a little pressure on it because I had to wear this 20 pound ponytail every day. Honestly, it looked really good, but I freaking hated the way it made my head feel. So the show quickly recaps their last season and holy forkamole, I totally forgot everything. I have goldfish memory. I can't remember a single thing. I totally forgot he sent topless pictures of Jasmine without her consent to his ex-girlfriend, which is absolutely sick. So sick and such a betrayal of trust and safety. And I also forgot about her meltdown when she confronted him and screamed her head off. I forgot about it all. How can you do that? <laughs> Gino's packing up his suitcase because he's going to Panama to see Jasmine. He packs his new hats, more hats, and even more hats. His suitcase is full of hats. Meanwhile, in Panama, Jasmine's at the plastic surgeon getting her poo nana tightened. She tells the doctor, make me a virgin doctor. And as he's down there, she actually asks him if it smells. Oh my God, girl. Why would you ask him that? Okay, do you really want him to go all up in there and do a sniff test? After he's done with his examination, they sit down and she tells him all about their sex life. Well, actually, sex less life. She tells him he can't finish, that she's tried everything with him. She's even tried sticking her finger up his poo-poo no-no to try to help him. I don't even want to know. Él nunca eyaculó. Se tiene que ir al baño a masturbarse. Le bailo, le modelo, se lo I'm sure Gino somewhere watching the scene absolutely horrified. They're on video chat. Jasmine goes, is that a new hat? Yeah, I got a new hat. Do you like it, Jasmine? And she's like, eh, yeah. Gino pulls up his shirt and he goes, do you want to see? I got new shorts too. And Jasmine just screams, show me your nipples. <laughs> what the then she asks him if her visa application got approved for her to come to the state. And he says, unfortunately, no, but hopefully it will be in the next month. And she's pissed because that means she has to move again. And I guess she's been doing monthly leases so she can get out as soon as her visa is approved. I don't know. I'm making that part up because that was unclear. But she's super annoyed with Gino because he refused to do the application with a lawyer because he wanted to save money. So she's worried that the approval keeps getting delayed or whatever because he's filled it out wrong. So she demands a super nice luxury apartment. It's $3,000 a month, which is crazy for a freaking two bedroom apartment. And he's like, why do you need two bedrooms? And she's like, one's for my sister. And she also says it's very spacious and they need a lot of space because when they have sex, it takes a lot of energy because she has to go hell and back to try to make him finish. Ugh. I'm super attracted to Jasmine. She's beautiful, gorgeous. But when we argue and fight, I, I lose my uh, desire. We find out Jasmine got what she wanted because she moved into her luxury apartment. She meets up with Dane, who is this really attractive man. He's dressed well, his hair styled well, and he lives in that building. And we also learn he's her ex-boyfriend right before Gino. I was shook. They couldn't be more opposite. Apparently things didn't work out between them because he was too normal. He was too calm, delicate. She got bored. She needs chaos and passion. Red flag. Basically, she needs a bitch. Okay, she needs someone she can control. And with Dane, she can't really do that because he could probably find another woman in a second. He'd leave her ass so fast. But Gino, mm -mm. <laughs> she knows she's way out of his league looks wise. And I think she likes that. I think she gets off on that. So Jasmine tells Dane about the time Gino sent her topless pictures to his ex. And because of that, she got banned from teaching. So not only did she get fired from her job, she can't find a teaching job. No one will hire her because of, ooh, that's a lady from 90 Day Fiance who took topless photos. Like, what the hell? She got fired for something she didn't even do. She took topless photos, which is not illegal. She sent them privately to her significant other, to her romantic partner. And then he released them without her consent. She's the victim here. That is not fair at all. And 
Honestly, that's fucked up, okay? Anyway, I did feel bad for her and I can see why she's so pissed off and she feels like he needs to take care of everything that she wants because she can't have an income. So this is where the episode ends. In the preview for the next week, there are three more couples that are gonna join the show. And honestly, they did like a super quick intro of each new couple and I could go without them. All right, well, that's it for the recap. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and I will talk to you in my next video. Bye!